So good day students, welcome to week six. Today we deal with uh, lecture 11 and uh, this lecture is on specific topics relating to government programs and these would be defense, research and technology. And the prescribed reading is Stiglitz and Rosengard chapter 12. Specifically, what we will be dealing with are defense expenditures, increasing the efficiency of the Defense Department. Uh, though this is obviously a US textbook, we will try to extrapolate to the United Kingdom, or at the very least, I would argue that the principles are still applicable. And we will also be speaking about research and technology. Now, first of all, why are we speaking about defense expenditures and how does this link to our uh, theme? Uh, from the previous uh, chapters, well, we've been speaking about public expenditures and defense is a large public expenditure. Specifically for the United States, it is the largest single item of public expenditure. So again, this is a public program, so that is why we are addressing it. Within the context of the United States, so for example, defense spending reached 14.7% of GDP. This was in 1953, and this corresponds to last year of the Korean War. So again, this simply demonstrates how the importance of defense spending as a program, public expenditure program. After the Vietnam War, so uh, expenditures fell to under 6% of GDP. And then during the 80s, as part of the Cold War, again, the increase to 7.4% in 1986 and 1987. So following the collapse of the Soviet Union, which would have been the early 90s, um, there was an excitement in the United States of a so-called peace dividend. A peace dividend is the newly available funds that arise due to a decrease in the defense spending attributable to a change in the political situation as we saw with the end of the Soviet Union or alternatively the end of the war. So there is excitement or there is a belief that funds will be available for other purposes because they are no longer being spent on defense due to changes in the uh, current situation. So what happened was that defense expenditures dropped to half of the 80 share of GDP. So you are seeing that peace dividend. And by 2000, uh, they were just 3.7% of GDP. So note, note the change. Quite a decrease uh, from between the 1980s and uh, the 2000s. So you are seeing that peace dividend there. So although the fall of the Soviet Union coincided with the end of the Cold War. It did not bring global peace. Shortly, there were other conflicts, specifically conflicts in the Balkans uh, in the mid 2000s and also conflicts in Sub-Saharan Africa, many of which are still go on ongoing. There was also concerns about nuclear proliferation. And uh, on September 2001, there was an attack on the World Trade Center in the United States. Uh, and this led to the global war on terror, or culminating with an invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan around 2003. Um, and this was a war that had no clear boundaries or clear victor for that matter. What is important about this is that we again saw a rise in defense expenditures, specifically uh, by 2010. Uh, the level of expenditure was 5.6% of GDP in 2005 dollars, and this was the highest uh, level in constant dollars since World War II. So if we take a look in terms of billions in panel A, what we see is that we have the highest peak in World War II occurring during World War II, we're looking at $2,005, and this is in terms of billions. So this is where we have billions on this axis, and this is where we have years. And then the next highest peak occurs around the, or during the Iraq and Afghanistan conflict. So this is around 2003, or at least starts in 2003. So somewhere at that point, and then expenditure increases. Now, here what we see is um, in panel B, we see federal defense expenditures as a percentage of GDP. So as a percentage of GDP, the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts are not the highest. Again, still World War II consumes about over or almost 45 percent of GDP um, between 1939 and uh, 1945. And we also have the Korean War being quite a significant uh, 
uh, expenditure as a percentage of GDP. So this is an overview of what defense expenditures look like uh, for the United States. And these expenditures include both government consumption and gross investment in productive capacity. So what do the patterns, defense expenditure patterns look like? So the United States spends 4.8% of total GDP on defense. And this translates to about 18% of government expenditure on defense. In comparison, the United Kingdom spends about 2.7%. And this is 5.7% as a total of government expenditure. So in other words, the United States spends about three times as much Note that Saudi Arabia spends about 10.4 of total GDP on its defense, but obviously because the United States has a much higher level of GDP, um, that 10.4% does not translate into the same or a greater amount in terms of dollars relative to the United States. And in fact, the United States spends more on defense than the next 19 countries collectively do. So now the question is, why is it that we are speaking about defense expenditures? Well, defense expenditure is a major item of the government budget, but it often receives little attention from economists. But ultimately, the principle is very much the same. Defense spending is fundamentally a question of resource allocation. So if you are not allocating resources to, let's say, social care or schooling or education or policing, you are allocating them to defenses. So again, this is a matter of public expenditure on public goods, goods that are provided to the public by government. So because we are dealing again with a question of resource allocation, the question that arises is then that of economic analysis. What we need to focus on is module benefits and costs. And that is what is essential to answer the question, how much should we be spending on defense and on any other government project for that matter? So the principle remains the same, and this is what I want to emphasize. So the focus of marginal analysis is how much can we get from spending the additional dollar on a given good? Within the context of defense, what we will be evaluating is whether we should spend more on defense. Um, and what we need to know in order to do this is to determine how much extra protection we would get from an extra expenditure of, let's say, one billion. Of course, this is analogous to how much of a return would we get from spending the additional dollar on any other good. So please remember this analogy. The idea is the same. So let's say that each missile that we can spend uh, money on has a 50% of killing its target, probability of killing its target. And we have a total of 100 targets that we would like to destroy. And the information that we have is that 100 missiles would achieve 50 kills. Then we have um, 200 missiles achieving 75 kills. And then what we have is 300 missiles achieving 87 kills. Note, what we are seeing is that the next 100 missiles returns fewer kills than the previous 100 missiles. So for example, the first 100 missiles result in 50 kills. The second 100 missiles add 25 kills. And then the next 100 missiles from 200 to 300 give us 12 kills. So there is a diminishing marginal return. So that, that is what we are seeing from having more missiles. So we are seeing diminishing returns. So let's say that we had 500 missiles in total. What would our total kill rate be? Well, it would be 100%, right? So this seems ideal, but this is not the question that we need to ask. The question that we need to ask is how many extra kills would we get from each additional missile? So although our total return keeps on increasing, what we see is that our marginal return decreases. So each additional missile fired or a batch of missiles, let's say we are talking about batches of 100, has a lower return than the previous missile or the previous 100 missiles. So we see sharply diminishing returns after a while. Think about it in a slightly different context. So let's say that you are writing an essay. The first draft, you actually write the essay. The second draft, what happens is that you correct a lot of mistakes and shorten it and edit it. The third draft is that you add it less and less. 
Let's say you get to the 10th draft. What is it that you would be doing? You'd be maybe dropping a full stop or adding a comma or dropping a word here or there. But you wouldn't really be getting the bulk of your return anymore at the 10th draft stage. Indeed, what you would be seeing is diminishing returns in terms of the improvements in quality from subsequent edits after a certain amount of edits. So that is what we are interested in. We are interested in these diminishing returns, specifically marginal returns. And that is what we use when we want to undertake a margin analysis. So now let's talk about the US's defense strategy. Uh, and the idea is here just to demonstrate how one of these programs works and what its focus could be. Of course, this can be extended to a whole host of other types of programs, whether it be health or education related. So the idea is the same. It's to gain an understanding of how these programs works, work. So we begin in the 1960s and 1970s. So what were the objectives of these defense strategies? First of all, it was deterrence. The idea was to establish a strong enough force that no one would contemplate attacking. So this was the central uh, strategy of the US and the Soviet Union after World War II. And that is why it was that period of time was called the Cold War because of the deterrence. There was no actual direct conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, the idea is that this deterrence comes through in terms of no actual direct conflict breaking out. So following the end of the Cold War and the dismantling of much of Russia's nuclear capabilities, no country had the capacity to maintain a sustained attack against the United States. So this led to questions as to do we still need a deterrence strategy? Because there is no competitor, there is no challenger anymore to the United States. So strategy has now shifted to a two theater capability strategy. So the idea is that the United States should be able to fight two localized wars of moderate scale simultaneously. So for example, we see both Iraq and Afghanistan being localized wars that are being fought or were fought um, simultaneously. There's also increased threats from non-conventional warfare, so for example terrorism, uh, so non-state entities, or new weapons uh, and those operating in cyberspace. So in other words, hack attacks, which we have seen around the United Kingdom. So this is a new form of warfare and some people like to refer to it as a non-kinetic form of warfare. So what this means is that uh, defense capability needs to now be enhanced in different areas because wars are now being fought differently. So also new priorities include counterterrorism. So uh, there are skills and technology that are required for the success in this arena. And um, these skills and technologies are very different from those that have marked military conflicts in the past. So also there has been a proliferation of weapons across the world, specifically after the fall of the Soviet Union. A lot of the weapons that were held by the Soviet Union potentially got into the wrong hands following the transition from the Soviet Union to what is now the Russian Federation. So the attention now has focused on reducing the number of nuclear warheads in Russia and also in countering arms proliferation in general. In other words, limiting the amount of weapons floating around the world. As you can imagine, uh, there is uh, the arms industry is profitable and there's many small countries that are interested in buying weapons. So there is a real danger that these weapons will feed into ethnic and political troubles that are now occurring around the world. And quite specifically, a number of these are occurring in sub-Saharan Africa. I cite instability in the Congo and also Mozambique as two examples. So what the US and 79 countries have done is they have signed a non-proliferation treaty in 1968 and the attempt here was to restrict access to nuclear weapons and methods of delivering them. So this is where this idea of non-proliferation begins and its initial focus was on nuclear weapons. I mean obviously these are the big weapons as opposed to small arms. And what these non-proliferation laws do is they impose sanctions against uh, 
individuals, private entities, and governments that engage in proliferation activities. In other words, they purchase arms and potentially use these or sell them to other states. Uh, and one of the most recent non-proliferation laws was signed um, in 2006, and this is called the Iran, North Korea, and uh, Syria Non-Proliferation Act of 2006. And what this does is it restricts sales and the provision of arms to these countries. So then what we have is the issue of chemical and biological weapons and terrorism. So whereas nuclear non-proliferation sanctions were the approach that started in the 1960s and was applied from that point onwards, what has now happened is that there is also now a focus on uh, the non-proliferation of uh, uh, chemical and biological weapons, uh, which are now referred to commonly as weapons of mass destruction. Uh, furthermore, uh, the 1991 Gulf War focused more attention on the threat of states using chemical and biological weapons, as did happen in the north of Iraq. And also there has been now a focus on establishing enforceable international agreements and cooperation to combat biological and chemical weapons and terrorism. Um, and also there has been research that has been aimed to build the capacity to develop antidotes quickly in response to biological and chemical weapons. So given the magnitude of the dangers that exist and specifically the threats that uh, exist to the United States, there is still a concern that the US is spending too little on such research, research relating to the development of antidotes specifically. So as you can see, what comes through is this discussion of where and how much should we be spending. A key issue is that any government project, any public expenditure should be spent well. And of course, this applies to defense. So no matter how much is spent publicly, it should be spent well. So uh, applying this to defense procurement specifically. So what happened during the Cold War is a number of firms or thousands of firms focused on supplying research and weapons required for expanding military capability in the United States. Uh, but uh, what was and what is important to note is that producing for the military is a lot different from producing for the civilian sector. So this is something that needs to be taken into account. So, for example, um, usually with the Department of Defense had only one supply of a particular plane. It was simply too expensive to have two or more producing uh, suppliers producing exactly the same plane. So note what applies to the consumer sector might not apply when we talk about public expenditure. So some of the procedures required that um, contracts go to the lowest bidder. Of course, you want to purchase a certain amount of weaponry from the lowest bidder and not from different bidders who will supply them at different prices, some supplying at a higher price and others supplying at a lower price. So, for example, government might want to purchase a thousand tanks. So what it will do is it will issue a tender. And what will ha happen is that numerous firms will then bid for that tender. And the idea is that the contract will go to that uh, bidder that offers the best equipment for at the lowest price. In other words, the lowest bidder that offers to do it at the lowest price. Of course, one of the issues with any government expenditure project and specifically military projects is that there will be major cost overruns. In other words, costs exceed producers original estimates. So what sometimes happens is that government recognizes and specifically this applies in uh, defense uh, in the defense industry. So what government might do is it might enter into a cost sharing contract. So what it does is it takes over any of the cost overruns that occur. So it absor absorbs all or a significant fraction of the additional cost, if need be. And the reason why government might do this is because often these sort of projects involve research and development. So, for example, you want to develop a new plane. Now, of course, there is always a risk with research and development that the research will not be successful. That is the nature of research. So if the risk was so high that, for example, the developing that plane would lead to the bankruptcy of a arms manufacturer, well, then no one would engage in doing this. 
in developing a new plane, in undertaking research and development that is required to build this plane. And that is where government can step in and say that any expenditure over and above this, we will have, we will account for this and we will uh, absorb a fraction of this additional cost or the entire cost if need be. So hence there is a safety net for the manufacturer to engage in that research and development. Now, we all, what we essentially have with cost overruns is an example of incomplete information. In other words, the government knows that it's going to purchase some kind of armament from a specific manufacturer, but cannot foresee uh, any cost overruns. All that it knows is that it let out the contract to the lowest bidder. So we see that government cannot see what will happen in the future and we cannot see those cost overruns. So that is what we discussed as a form of market failure in this instance. Again, this sort of market failure is what would prevent certain research and development taking place. So one way we could increase the efficiency of the Defense, the defense Department is to ensure that there is good monitoring and uh, procurement. Um, the reason why is because there is generally a belief that there is a problem with defense contracting and not the cost overruns themselves. The idea or the argument is that what should happen is that there are detailed procedures that ensure that government is not cheated by the private sector. And what this requires is um, monitoring and record keeping. And this reduces the flexibility that firms need to produce in a cost effective manner. So it acts as a double edged sword. The idea is to make sure that government gets a good deal, but at times the creation of additional bureaucracy is what reduces flexibility and hence limits firms from producing in a cost effective manner. So what government often does is it buys exactly the same equipment that the private sector buys, you know, let's say a jet engine. Um, but because of inflexible procedures, what happens is that government lands up paying a lot more. So it is not getting its efficiency. It's the, the process is not efficient. And the reason why this is the case is because it costs a firm because of these procedures that apply to the trade relationship between the Department of Defense and a firm. What these procedures do is they inflate costs because it costs these firms substantially more to produce a given item. So what happened in response in 1994 was that the Department of Defense reformed its con uh, procurement procedures with the intention of making them conform more closely to those that were standard in the private sector. Why? Because the private sector focuses on efficiency. It has a motive to do so, and those are profits specifically. So one aspect is the focus on dual use technologies, and these are technologies that can be used by both civilian and military customers. The advantage in this is that for many, many of these items, there is already a large market. Um, so they are not only producing for government and government is not the only buyer. So essentially a form of a monopoly relationship or monopoly market that arises. They're also producing for the private sector. So hence what the Department of Defense does, it tries to buy technologies that already exist and are also used by non-military players. So defense also matters from a research and development perspective. So what has happened is that a lot of defense research and development projects have resulted in um, technology that we use today. So for example, the jet engine and supercomputers were byproducts of research and development expenditures by the defense industry. Uh, also, other research that has been funded by government is internet and biotech um, although this was not for defense purposes. If we look at defense expenditure as a total of government research and development expenditure, we see that it is quite a significant portion. So this is government research uh, and development expenditure in the defense sector, whereas this is government non-defense research and development, this, uh, this curve here. So 
government expenditure on defense matters. Why? Because it is associated with a lot of expenditure on research and development. And what we see is positive externalities in the form of technology that is used outside of the defense sector also. If we look at research and development expenditure by nations, by the top 10, the United States is by far the biggest spender, spending 415 billion on research and development expenditure. Uh, and this is almost um, three times as much as the second largest spender being China. So uh, the United States is responsible for 33.2% of global spending. Uh, the nearest competitor, again, being China, is 12%, followed by Japan, which is also approximately 12%. So uh, what emerges is that the United States is a massive spender. Although its expenditure on research and development as a percentage of GDP is unlikely or is not as high as that of some other countries, uh, such as Israel, let's say, and such as Finland and such as Sweden, although we must remember that all of these countries have a smaller economy and therefore a lower GDP than that of the United States. So therefore, that 2.8% in, in uh, dollar terms is far greater than the higher percentages in dollar terms for these countries that um, I have pointed out here. Nevertheless, although the United States is a massive spender uh, on research and development, there has been a slowdown in productivity in general uh, since the 1970s. And it is argued that this slowdown in productivity is attributable to an underinvestment in research and development. So a question that arises is, is this a market failure? Is there some reason as to why the market is no longer, the private market is no longer investing sufficient amounts in research and development. And we must think of knowledge that is produced from research development as a public good. And as a result of that, what will happen is that the private sector will underinvest in this public good because it might not be able to directly benefit. And research and development can be viewed as a public good, and there is no incentive to invest and produce these public goods. Why? Because the, it costs nothing for an additional individual to enjoy the benefits of these public goods, and it is difficult or impossible to exclude individuals from enjoying pure public goods. So this is why the government should provide the production of knowledge, by investing in research and development, specifically by supporting research and development. So if there is an underinvestment from the private sector and research and de development, essentially what we are seeing is we are seeing a market failure. And one potential reason why we are seeing this market failure is because Certain firms might invest in knowledge, but then cannot reap the benefits of that investment. And that is why we assign property rights in the form of patents to the discoverer of knowledge so that they have the exclusive use of that knowledge and the right to license it to others for a limited period of time. So therefore, if the private sector invests in research development and develops either some kind of knowledge or technology, the developer of that can benefit from it. So now there is an incentive by using these patents. Also, what we can have is we can use copyrights. And what these do is they give the exclusive legal right to the originator for a number of fixed years to print, publish, perform, film, or record literary, artistic, or musical material. So again, this protects the production of knowledge. So patents and copyrights establish intellectual property rights, which ensure that inventors and authors can appropriate some of the fruits of their labor for some of the time. They usually tend to be limited in their duration. So for example, a patent might run out in 10 or 15 years when then others can start using that knowledge. And patents are very widely used in the medical industry or the pharmaceutical industry where specific medication is produced or researched and then produced and then is patented for let's say 20 years. And after 20 years, what can happen is that other pharmaceuticals can start producing that medication. 
But as you can imagine, no pharmaceutical would invest in research and development to develop a specific, a specific drug or medication, and then others would reap the benefits by reproducing it. There is a trade-off when a patent is used. So uh, what a government can do is it extend the life of a patent. patent um, and uh, by doing so, it provides great incentives for private firms to gauge, engage in research and development. Why? Because they can benefit from that knowledge for a longer period of time. On the other hand, a patent is essentially a monopoly on knowledge, and if it is extended for a long period of time, then there is a risk that that knowledge will not be used efficiently for a longer period of time. In other words, let's say we are using a file, we are talking about a pharmaceutical. What will happen is that although there might be um, competitors who will produce that medication at a lower cost by developing new technologies, they will be unable to do so because of a patent. So let's look at the effect of a patent using our framework. So what we have is we have a some kind of medication and uh, it, a certain quantity of that medication can be consumed, which we we'll present on this um, axis. And what we now have is we have a demand curve for that medication. Let's say that prior to the invention of that medication, we have a cost that um, corresponds to C subscript zero. And what happens is that this is now also the price. So we assume we charge a price that corresponds to a cost. At this point, the quantity that is consumed is Q subscript zero. So then once invention takes place, what happens is this is the quantity that is consumed. Now let's say all of a sudden there is a small invention. So we've invented a drug or we've researched a drug and we are selling it and this is a quantity that we are selling. But then what happens is there's a small invention, improves technology and lowers the costs of production. So therefore we could sell it at a potentially lower price, okay, which would correspond to quantity Q subscript one. Now, what would happen if a rival firm was able to start selling that medication at a lower cost? It would take the entire market. And this would happen if information was freely available. In other words, if there were no patents. So what would happen is that this new competitor or this firm that made a small invention uh, or that would improve costs, lower costs, and then produce a medication at lower cost without needing to invest in research and development would put out their original inventor out of business. So what is the impact of a patent? Well, initially the impact of a patent is that we have a quantity that is produced and sold that is not the optimal quantity which is represented by q subscript one so this is where we are and what arises is as a loss to society in the form of a dead weight loss which is represented by b d and f so this is a dead weight loss, and this is associated with output being smaller than otherwise would have been had there been no patent. But when the patent expires, the price will fall. So this is the price that we will see here, and the quantity demanded will increase. But what will also happen is that the original inventor no longer has a monopoly on that knowledge. So hence, the return to the innovator will also then drop to zero at that point in time when the patent expires. Continuing from the previous slide, what we see is that the longer the life of the patent, the greater the dead weight loss associated with inefficiency, the inefficiency of giving a firm a monopoly over the use of information. However, the trade-off is that the innovator receives a return for a longer period of time, in other words, a greater return, and hence there is an incentive to innovate. Remember that you will not innovate if you produce knowledge, invest in producing knowledge, but then cannot benefit from it because there is no incentive. And this is what intellectual property rights do. However, they may interfere with the efficient utilization of knowledge, and that is reflected in the so-called dead weight loss that we saw on the previous slide. So giving a firm and a monopoly on the production of a new product will result in too small, a too small level of production, too little of 
product will be produced arising from that knowledge, as we saw on the previous slide, when we had a pharmaceutical that had a monopoly on a specific drug. The price was higher, the quantity was lower. So the idea is ultimately that if we make access to prior knowledge, knowledge more difficult, then follow-up research is discouraged because you cannot build on previous knowledge because you can't access it directly or access it fully.